see. Hello, everyone. I can just see all our uh, attendees that were in the waiting room loading in. I'm just going to give it a moment um, before we start so people can join. Great, lots of people popping in here. I know it's funny you see the different connections, <laughs> how quickly people join up. But uh, as I can see, it's slowing down a little bit. I will start uh, by introducing the session. So welcome to the 2022 Guelph Organic Conference. Thank you for joining us for the Less is More, Reducing On-Farm Food Waste in Organic Vegetable Production and Exploring alternative packaging session. I'd like to first start by um, acknowledging that the sacred land where the Organic Council of Ontario and the Guelph Organic Conference resides is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credits people. Um, please take a moment to reflect on where you are situated and the history of the lands you now occupy. We welcome you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat, and we encourage you to learn uh, about the history of the land you are in relationship with by visiting whoseland and nativeland.ca, and these links will be added in the chat. So how to participate in the session? I know everyone's pretty used to Zoom by now, but um, we'd first like to invite you to introduce yourself in the session chat uh, located on the right side of your screen. Make sure your chat audience is set to everyone. It, sometimes it defaults to panelists. Um, that way everyone in the chat will be able to see what you're saying. There will be time to ask speakers questions after the presentations. And there are two ways to ask questions. First, you can write your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen. It's really helpful if you put those in the Q&A box instead of the chat, it just helps keep them organized and make sure we catch all of them. And then you can also raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to um, ask a question live. You can raise your hand at any time and then we'll call on you during the Q&A portion. We are also happy to provide French interpretation for this program uh, provided by Brian Bickford and Adrian Adams. Uh, to turn on live French interpretation, click on the interpretation icon and select French. And then finally, we're so fortunate to have these presenters share their knowledge and experience with us, as well as the community of attendees that have joined the session. So we just ask that you please communicate respectfully uh, with all session participants in the chat and with your questions. Uh, so just a bit about the Organic Council of Ontario. We've been so fortunate to be able to be a host of um, this year's Guelph Organic Conference. OCO is the Voice of Organics in Ontario, a membership-based nonprofit association that represents Ontario's organic sector. OCO is the only trade association working and advocating on behalf of the entire organic industry from field to plate. Our membership includes all certified organic operators, but supporting members are our main source of revenue and also receive benefits. If you like the work that we do and you believe in strong local organic food systems, consider becoming a member today. For updates on agricultural news, resources, funding opportunities, green jobs, and more sign up for, and more sign up for our e-news on our website and there should be a link in the chat. And then the OCO AGM, it's March 31st and we're currently recruiting board members please see the chat for, to put forward a nomination. Lastly, this year's conference uh, theme was inspired by OCO's Organic Climate Solutions Campaign. Uh, through this campaign funded by the Government of Canada's Climate Action and Awareness Fund, we wanna raise awareness of the environmental and economic benefits of organic and regenerative farming practices and the re resources available to support farmers in taking up these practices. Okay, and then we'd like to uh, extend a big thank you to Tomas Nemo for his 40 plus years of commitment to the organic sector and his long standing work with the Guelph Organic Conference. Uh, the Guelph Organic Conference has been an important meeting place for the sector over its many years. That's not to say Thomas, uh, Tomas is still not a big part of the planning this year 
And while OCO is hosting this year's virtual conference, um, the conference will move forward as it has in the past years once we're back in person. And finally, the Guelph Organic Conference would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, you will be able to connect with all of our sponsors in the exhibit hall on the conference website. Thank you to our GROW level sponsors, Yorkshire Valley Farms and EcoCert, and our Flourish level sponsors, Canadian Organic Growers, ProCert Organic Systems, the Government of Canada, and um, Fennings Organic Farm. We'd also like to acknowledge our appreciation for the financial support provided by the Prairie Organic Development Fund, um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for this session as part of a 10-part series of trainer, producer trainings. And then lastly, uh, this session sponsor, Fennings Organic Farm, we'd like to give you a special thank you and I'll invite Jen Fennings to say a few words. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's attending today. You know, um, we're all uh, maybe tired of Zoom, but at least we have an opportunity to see each other virtually and connect, uh, even though we can't come together in person. And I look forward to meeting people again when we are able to meet in person. A little bit about our farm for anyone who uh, isn't familiar. Um, Fennings Organic Vegetables is a family vegetable farm. Um, Wolfgang, who's going to be speaking later, uh, and uh, his parents moved here, and the, the family has been farming in Canada organically since 1981. We've always been organic uh, since our time in Canada, and um, we've been very happy to be involved in the Guelph Organic Conference over the years. There have been a lot of challenges and the Guelph Organic Conference has been a great place to share ideas, come together and uh, explore solutions that face, uh, that, that address the problems we all face. I'd like to acknowledge that we also farm on the land that was traditionally the home of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Mississauga peoples. I like to think about the treaty that existed between Indigenous nations before settlers arrived, the Dish with One Spoon Covenant. It asks us to consider our fellow people on this planet, to take only what we need, leave enough for others and keep the dish clean. And I think of that in the sense of organic farming and how much that means to the way that we go about farming and working together in our community, in this community of organic farmers. We engage to grow food locally on our land in the best way that we possibly can. And we really love to work with other local farmers, both to sell to them and to buy from them. And it's a symbiotic relationship where we support each other and face the future and whatever it brings stronger because we are working together. So have a great conference. And uh, if you're interested, Wolfgang and I will be attending the uh, trade, virtual trade show booth tomorrow. And uh, you can talk with us further there if you uh, don't get your questions answered in the session today. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you to Fennings Organic Farm for um, supporting this session and the conference overall. And so now I would like to uh, kick the session off uh, and introduce the session's moderator, Norm Hansen. Currently, Norm is the Director of Research and Development for Erie View Acres. Erie View Acres is the premier Lemington area grower of certified organic greenhouse vegetables. Currently, they grow in 19 acres of greenhouses at three locations. Norm's top priorities for the organic sector include getting organic standards, review funding in place, enacting Ontario organic legislation, and increasing membership, sector organization coordination, and organic grower participation. And so with that, I will pass it off to you, Norm. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, today, we're going to have four speakers on the topic of reducing food waste. Uh, Wolfgang Fenning will be starting us off with an overview of uh, reducing food waste and how Fennings does it. 
Then we're going to have Amy Kitchen. She will show us their system on a smaller scale farm. Uh, then <coughs> Dan McKean will show us how they upcycle waste. And lastly, uh, my favorite, um, Alan Kirkpatrick will discuss sustainability in the corrugated packaging business. Now you might wonder why Alan Kirkpatrick is my favorite. Well, quite coincidentally, um, uh, almost 30 years ago now, my wife and I named our youngest son, Kirk Patrick Hansen. And so uh, that's, a, um, um, that's a cool coincidence as far as, uh, as, far as um, uh, names go. So I, I noticed that right away when I saw Alan Kirkpatrick. I will now introduce Wolfgang. Um, Wolfgang Fenning grew up growing organic vegetables. Uh, back in 1981, when the Fenning family moved to New Hamburg, Ontario, bringing their organic growing practices with them, he was just 17 years old. A curious mind, he is always experimenting to solve problems and create efficiencies. Wolfgang has seen a lot in the 40 years the family has been growing in New Hamburg, Ontario. His best piece of farming advice, be prepared for plans to change. Go ahead, Wolfgang. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for everybody to join this. Um, we have prepared a PowerPoint presentation here. So let me see that we can get this uh, started. Okay, here we go. That should be on, right? Yes, we can see it. Thanks. You, you know, you young people are all better in the internet than me, but it took a couple minutes to come up with um, some information. And in the chat box, you'll find the link to this, um, to this first slide, which gives a rough overview or the, the one in the, in the link is, gives you a lot of information um, compared to this one. And you can look that up on your own, but to put it really short, uh, also the CBC reported that 58% of the food produced is not eaten. That means it gets lost along the way from the field all the way to the dinner plate. Um, and in this case, it breaks down into 30% of the cereals, bread, cookies, crackers, whatever that is, um, <clears throat> is not being consumed. Uh, a lot of statistics could be made in where along the line it gets lost. And it goes on with 40 to 50% of root crops, 20% of vegetables. And what strikes me, 35% of meat and dairy and fish is not being consumed. Um, I always thought that this industry would have things more under control and you can keep them longer or so. So I don't know, um, I didn't do more research into this other than take what I could read. Important to know is where along the line does the food get lost? If it's very close to the production uh, or to the field or wherever it got produced, it's different from when you throw the food in the, in the compost after you've had it on the dinner plate, because when it gets to that point, it used up all resources to get it right through the entire supply chain into the household, and then it gets thrown away. So basically that's the most expensive loss. If you lose crop in the field that you didn't even harvest, it's the cheapest loss. There are many reasons why uh, food doesn't leave the field, uh, if you want to put it that way, or turns into waste in the field. And you could have frost in Florida freezing the, the citrus crop, or we have rains. Last year in Ontario, we had in September on already saturated ground on our farm, 
six inches of rain, which made the fields, quite a few fields flood in certain areas too long so that the carrot crop rotted, causing a humongous problem later on during production. Um, you, what, what does it mean global and local scheduling problems? That means if growing regions, for example, in California, they have three or four different main regions and they move with the season north and south into different regions. If in the spring, the weather is different than expected, certain growing regions come on, for example, here with lettuce, while a previous region is still in production and that doubles up crops, but it also can go the other way where you create gaps. And so that's a big problem with, and the bigger the industry gets, the bigger those scheduling issues become. Labor shortage during harvest uh, it's also a huge problem because if there's a crop out there and there are no people to pick them, um, it gets lost. Part of post-harvest handling is uh, there are different steps al along the way. Um, one, the main part is post-harvest handling for the summer, no matter where you go, is the, the cooling, pre-cooling. Uh, we bring all our products off the field and they go through a forced air cooling system where it pulls the heat out of the crop very quickly, uh, making it shell last a lot longer. And basically it is like if you, for every hour you can't get the heat out of the, out of the, whether it's broccoli or lettuce or kale, if you, you lose a day of shelf life. Um, during processing and packing, you have grading losses. Give me a second here. I wanna see if I can get this started. <clears throat> there you go. You see our carrot packing line and you see conveyor belts moving and you see the people picking the carrots on one area and moving, throwing them over the little fence onto another slot. Uh, those are the good carrots that get packed into two pound bags and the others turn cannot get packed into two pound because they don't meet the specifications for length and diameter and shape and so on. And they either go into compost or get cut for other uh, other uh, areas in the marketplace, but you always have loss. And sometimes you only pack 50, 60% of the carrots you harvest in the two pound. <clears throat> the rest don't meet spec, but we try to turn them into juice carrots or other uh, destinations. Miscommunication in the industry is a big thing and sometimes it is even played between, between vendors and customers, like on the, on the big supply chain system, not necessarily the end consumer, but between companies, they play games, they hold one company against another to lower prices. And along all that, sometimes the industry has to accept good losses because of of games and politics in the marketplace. Transportation challenges are a big problem. Uh, and if you have good relationships, you can work through those transportation challenges. Uh, but if you don't have the connections and relationships, you might have a load, but you can't find a truck or the truck has delays and so on. Food losses occur in the distribution industry. A lot of times it has to do 
in our industry, we're vegetable people. So I can't speak for the entire industry because vegetables are more perishable than dry goods. But if a truck gets stuck in a snowstorm on the way here from California, and he's delayed by two days or three days, <clears throat> maybe it's not even so much that the product gets two days older on the truck. But if that truck was supposed to arrive on a Thursday, so that the product can go on the Friday deliveries for the main shopping on the weekend. If that truck is delayed and he only re reaches Ontario on Saturday, by the time that product hits the market, the weekend shopping opportunities are gone. And then that product hits the market the following week. But a lot of large companies have several trucks on the road and the next truck will be catching up in Ontario while the first product is still there. And then the big supermarkets or the big distribution centers, like for, you could call Loblaws or Sokis or whatever, all of a sudden they have more trucks coming in with product when they didn't have the previous one sold already. And then there are big issues with where would the product go? Sometimes these big warehouses don't have space to unload the truck. So the truck has to sit for a day or two. You have, there are huge problems within the supply chain. <clears throat> also a late arrived truck can miss the connection in an other outbound truck. And then that causes further delays. The distribution center management sometimes have staffing problems or internal politics, and then product in those warehouses gets mismanaged or misplaced, and then it would spoil because it didn't go into the right cooler and things like that. We, have, we all have experience in this, and we've all taken our losses by what the, where, what the distribution centers messed up. So we have life uh, experience with that. If the shopping patterns change quickly, for example, through a snowstorm, people don't go shopping on the weekend, the product is there, then that's the same as earlier when the truck didn't arrive. Now the customers didn't show up because of a storm. And then the stores have displays built but the people aren't buying them and the product spoils the most on display. And you can see that sometimes if you go on a Friday or Saturday into a supermarket produce department and you see what it looks like, um, it's hard for the people to manage there. Short dated product is is critical because people want so much time on whatever they buy that is dated. And then sometimes perfectly good product gets thrown out because of the dates not there. Retail level, you probably have the biggest losses <clears throat> because of product being on display. And this picture right here that you see, I took that at one of our customers who is doing a phenomenal job in Toronto. Uh, it's called Fiesta Farms that manages the produce department very well. And product that's not so perfect, they wrap it up and put it in the discount uh, shelf. So whoever wants to buy that food can pay 50%. And I, I haven't seen it in many other stores organized as well as there. So I thought I'd take that picture and put it into this PowerPoint uh, to show what can be done to not throw all this in the dumpster. Uh, yeah. Other losses at retail happen when, again, the truck arrives late and the customers want food. And then when the truck does come, the customers are gone. Those are scheduling things. When stores have shortages in labor, 
that's a problem because then they can't manage their department, they can't pick through it, then the department doesn't look attractive and people buy less and it can spiral out of control very quickly uh, within a store. And to manage the department, to place the order on time, to make the decisions what to buy and how to buy, or even rotate inventory. If they don't rotate inventory right, that's a problem. Then they send uh, old stuff gets older in the cooler and newer stuff gets taken. And with at the current time with so many people off work, it's very hard for stores to, to have enough staff on hand. Food recalls are a big um, way to lose food because food gets recalled, it's very expensive. And at the same time, it ends up in landfill. So <clears throat> this is another big one to uh, lose food. And customers, sometimes I grew up in Europe. What you see in Europe on a supermarket shelf or in the produce department, uh, a lot of that couldn't be sold here. But in Europe, they have historic, in history, uh, food shortages in the country. And it's amazing how long that memory sticks around even in the next generation. So people aren't so picky in Europe. In, at the household level, uh, overbuying or not having the list when going shopping is one of the things that we buy too much food and then we can't use it, can't eat it and so on. Expired food is probably the biggest issue that people buy and not eat everything and then it gets old and then they throw it out. If you look at yogurt, when the date's off, you can't sell yogurt, but yeah. There's a different ways of looking at it. Yogurt is already old milk or fermented milk. But for dating, uh, the, the dating issues, that's a big thing. The, in, in Britain, I read an article recently, they are going away from the, from the, there are two systems. One is best before date, and the other one is use by. And in Britain, they want to go away from the use by system because the two systems somehow don't work right or don't do the same thing and people get confused. So they, they're trying to update uh, the expiry date system to make it more user-friendly. You lose food in the kitchen when you're trimming and cut, cleaning up your food. You always trim away. That's very natural. Um, the skill with dealing with food or what can you do with food that's getting old is what could help a lot to reduce food waste. You know, if the fridge has extra carrots and turn it, to go then go turn it into a soup and put it in the tub and put it in the fridge or freezer and then it can keep um, maybe cooking skills could get better so people don't lose so much and the last of these losses is uh, not eating all the food that's on the dinner plate uh, and that's the most expensive loss because it made it right through the entire supply chain all the way onto the dinner plate. Um, there are many solutions to all these problems. Uh, the question is, we have to pick them and see if they are financially viable. For us on the farm, <clears throat> is we're trying to plant crops according to the market. And every year we make comments to how everything went. And then we make adjustments for the next season, hoping to bridge all the gaps that developed over the year. 
But again, every year there are new surprises and we have to get used to new challenges. Um, better customer communication means we need to get in contact with all the people that get food from us and do the coordinating so that, again, with the aim to not lose as much crop either in the field or along the way. But that's also not so easy sometimes because sometimes we even, we here on the farm get a broccoli uh, double crop. That means one due to weather, even though the plants get started in the greenhouse in on the right schedule, at harvest, it could happen that two blocks come on at once, creating a glut now and in two weeks down the road, a gap. So we have to learn how to manage that. You know, the equipment that handles all the food through grading and sizing and so on also creates a little damage sometimes. And either better equipment or fixing wherever food gets bruised is important so that you end up with more packable food, like potatoes, for example. They can't have any bruises. Uh, and if they do, we have to throw them away. When we end up having, for example, a double crop we, uh, on broccoli, we need to be able to redirect that or find a home for it. And communication and good relationships with everybody in the industry in that moment is your, your best bet to make that product find a home. Or you make a put a deal on like the supermarkets, they sell it at uh, sell off like Fiesta at a reduced price. <clears throat> I said it earlier, um, to, to improve the best before system, the two systems used by or best before uh, is something to be worked on. And some of the consumers and customers right in the supply chain don't always know how to look after vegetables. Um, I know mostly the vegetable and not so much the other grocery items, but in this case, um, educating consumers and customers how to look after vegetables is very important because that's when big losses happen. I put a website in here, oops, from a company which is local. I knew them and I just wanted to find them and I Googled uh, food recycling and they came right up. And you can see they are taking all the bread, bakery, cracker, anything the supermarkets in Ontario don't sell, doesn't go into a dumpster, it's get, it gets picked up, it gets through these machines that chew it up to take the plastic out and then they make pig feed out of it. If you Google food, way, food recycling Ontario, you'll find three or four companies. I know of another company. They take all the meat, uh, meat waste, and they process it and produce a material that's being sent then to the United, to United States to make biofuel. So they are in Ontario processing all the meat it, that's a pre-step into that biofuel system. So you'll find all kinds of companies around that are working in this. But the issue with that is uh, locally where we have a lot of population, this is possible because transportation isn't so much compared to how much material gets produced but if you go to Northern Ontario, where there are 500 people in a village and there's food waste over there, you can't bring that down to a Southern Ontario <clears throat> because of the distance. So all these systems work, but 
if the miles to bring the food to are too big, then it, it gets too expensive for transportation. So it doesn't work everywhere. And I think they put a nice circle in here of the product flow and what they do and so on. So what do we do on our farm to reduce food waste on our farm? And depends a little bit what product it is. Uh, some items we try to pre-sell in the field, some you can't. So it, it, it changes, but uh, again, if the sales department has the connections to the consumers and knows this product is coming, they, they can um, give everybody a heads up so that when we have it, they can move. If we can cool it properly, lettuce can keep even for a while in the cooler to make those lumps go through. Um, because production on lettuce, for example, isn't steady, even though we're planting a new field every two weeks. Sometimes you have two in one and then you have a gap and you need somehow to bridge the gaps and lower the, uh, the glots. And best cooling practices are the most effective way at that moment. We could pack according to orders, but then sometimes you don't always sell the whole field. So you're always getting caught between those two scenarios that either you pack the orders or you harvest and put things in the cooler or the third is to pre-sell. But a combination of all those three items is what usually helps us sell. But when you have hot weather coming and heavy rains, um, it can make the lettuce go off very quickly. And then you don't harvest it because it's not nice enough to harvest. <clears throat> to manage the storage areas, it's a talent in itself. Um, Pre-cooling, quick cooling to extend shelf life is one of them. But then all the different products need different climate in the cooler. So we need uh, many different coolers for different products. Squash needs a different, different temperature and airflow or from broccoli, for example. And some, some fruits mostly uh, produce ethylene. If you all know, ethylene is an aging agent for vegetables. And if they get exposed to it, broccoli gets yellow, carrots go bitter. Um, all, more, most vegetables don't like ethylene. Uh, they start aging quicker and therefore you lose shelf life in it. So if we learn how to manage ethylene, um, crops can keep very well. For example, if you have kiwis, they are super, super uh, sensitive to ethylene. And if you put the kiwis in a completely different room all by their own, they're fine. But if as soon as they get a little bit of ethylene, they shrivel up and don't last long. Broccoli is very similar. So the right combination between ethylene, airflow, temperature, humidity, in produced in the different rooms and you keep your foods in those rooms makes the food keep the longest and it'll still look very good. <clears throat> so those are basically um, what we do here. Um, of course, there are many, many more things to talk about, but maybe that can come up during our Q&A uh, time. And with this, I guess I turn it over back to uh, you guys uh, for the next or if there are questions now, however you like, it doesn't matter to me how we deal with those. Thank you. Wolfgang, do you want to just stop sharing your screen quickly? Yeah. 
Is it gone? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next up. Next up, we've got uh, Amy Kitchen. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang. That was great. Uh, next up, we've got Amy Kitchen. Uh, Amy owns and operates Sideroad Farm, a small diversified certified organic farm in Gray County, Ontario, with her partner, Patrick, another Patrick. Um, Sideroad Farms grows vegetables, cut flowers, chicken, and pork, and direct markets to their community through year round CSA programs, a summer farmer's market to select retail restaurant establishments and via their busy on store farm. Originally from BC, Amy moved to Ontario with Patrick in 2013, where they have slowly built their farm operations from the ground up. Amy and Patrick are always looking for ways to improve the farm's impact, including implementing regenerative practices and reducing waste at all levels of their operation. Go ahead, Amy. Okay, thank you. Oh, good, thanks for the slides. Um, you'd think that after two years of Zoom meetings, I'd figure out how to blur the background out so you didn't have to look at the bright sunshine outside, but I haven't figured out how to do that. So sorry about that, everybody. Um, and thanks for having me here today um, online and thanks Wolfgang for your presentation and setting the stage I think so well for this conversation that we're having. Um, it was really interesting to hear what you're talking about because I think even though we're on such different scales, our farms, there's so many parallels um, in my presentation that I think you'll see too. Um, so I'm here today to chat with you about how we're minimizing food waste on our farm, um, which which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the peoples of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations. I want to start by giving thanks to the Chippewas of the Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land in what is known as Gray County, Ontario. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, just to set the stage, uh, Norm kind of gave you an overview of our farm, but we are a small family run farm um, that we're growing certified organic vegetables on about eight acres, uh, cut flowers, pasteurized pork and chicken. We direct market all of our products that we produce here um, 12 months a year. So farmers markets, uh, CSA programs, on farm store um, that operates both online and in person. And, um, and to some local retailers, our food, our food co-op, which is based out of Owen Sound um, and some restaurants. Okay, so next slide. Um, so why is this important? Why are we talking about this? I think in the bigger picture, as producers of food, um, we recognize that we are part of a larger system, uh, the food system, and that we, you know, as one point in the food system need to be doing our part to minimize food waste that we create on our farm. Um, and rather than contribute to the global problem, look for solutions, um, however small scale they may be, so that collectively we're working together to make improvements. Um, and from a farmer or business person's perspective, uh, food waste is, uh, it comes at a cost environmentally and financially. Um, for us, like if we're doing the work to plant and grow the food and it never actually ends up being part, um, it never actually ends up on the plate of a human or another living being, <clears throat> we've sort of effectively altered an ecosystem and potentially had a negative impact and wasted inputs, seed fertilizer, compost, labor, um, and this should be fairly obvious that that's a financial cost to the producer. Um, if I've learned anything in my years of farming is that uh, farmers need to be good business people to keep their farms running. Um, and so of course, waste in this sense is, is not a very good business practice. So a, a metric for us that's important is to look at our sales per acre every year. Um, we've sort of gone, we're, we're not interested in growing our farm anymore, but we are interested in ensuring that we are being as productive as possible on the land base that we are using. Um, so we track our sales per acre as an important metric of time to help us understand like how well we're managing that waste. 
Uh, okay. Um, so when I was asked to speak today, I have to be honest, I had to kind of sit down and write out all of the things that we were doing that I would consider to be our systems for minimizing food waste. Uh, it's not necessarily something that we've sit down and planned for in any formal sense of the word, but I think sort of naturally over the years, we've worked out that obviously waste is not a, a great thing on our farm and um, for the reasons I just explained. And so that we are working to minimize any waste uh, wherever possible. Uh, it's something that we consider in all points of our production system and we're constantly tweaking to make improvements as things change on our farm and as time goes on. Um, a really great resource if you're starting to think about this um, for your farms or for your, for your life is uh, to look at Ben Hartman's Lean Farm Guide and Lean Farm Guide to Growing Vegetables. Those are two really important books that explain the concepts of waste and strategies to reduce them on your farm. I highly recommend them. Okay, so for us, um, minimizing waste always starts before the seeds are ordered and the crops are planted. Uh, we tend to end every season while, while some of our seasonal staff or most of our seasonal staff are still um, working with us by having an all staff review meeting where we talk about each crop. Um, and this often leads to discussions about sort of what we need more of and what we need less of. Um, and that then we take, we take that information as, as the crop managers or the field managers and we, we work that into our crop plans for the next year. Uh, in the practical sense, our crop plan is basically just an Excel document that lays out the timing and size of the plantings of all the different crops that we're growing in a diverse market garden setting. Um, and over time, this process helps us work out matching our production to what we predict our demand will be for the upcoming year. And our big focus here is producing what our customers want and when they want it. Um, which is not something that's necessarily intuitive when you first start um, a market garden or start farming. Um, but over time, you can work out that your customers, for example, only want to buy bok choy in the spring and the fall when there isn't uh, an, a range of other vegetables available to them. And so even though I think bok choy is a good example of a crop that grows really well in the spring and the fall, uh, but you can grow it through the summertime, um, but we don't anymore because we find that that there's not as much demand for it during that time period. Uh, we also found it works best for us to produce multiple smaller plantings and adjust quantities um, through the season based on customer demand for certain things that we consider our quick crops like salad greens, radishes, salad turnip, cilantro. Those are things we're planting weekly and um, they have a fairly short field time. So like 21 days for some greens from planting to harvest. So within that time period, we have a good understanding of what the demand's like uh, going to be upcoming and we may adjust our plantings. Um, while we're in the season planning phase, we're also considering the resources that we need to actually get the crops from the seed to the plate. So the inputs, the equipment, the labor, um, the storage requirements, these are all really important considerations ahead of time um, because what we found is obviously, you know, it's one thing to plant a bunch of plants in the ground or put a bunch of seeds in the ground, um, but do you have the resources needed at the time that they're needed to see that crop through to the end consumer? And for us, that the labor is a big part of this. Do we have the adequate staffing to weed, harvest, and process what we plan to grow? Um, another thing, and, and Wolfgang alluded to this too, crop loss and waste happens when you're not prepared to manage pests um, and other environmental considerations. So things, uh, thinking about things in the planning phase, like do you have enough insect netting um, for your mustard green mixes that you're planting, uh, which have to be protected from flea beetles? And do you have the labor available to protect what you're planning to plant when it needs to be protected? Uh, we also consider how we're feeding our soil and crops um, so that they can resist pest pressures and grow into high quality marketable crops. Uh, on the flip side, if they're poorly fed, stressed, um, there's a greater likelihood that they're gonna be left in the field to compost or rot because um, you've produced an unmarketable crop after, after putting some time and resources into growing it. Obviously things happen beyond our control, but the idea is just to try to be as prepared as possible ahead of time to minimize loss um, in, during the growing season. 
So a final note on this slide, and I think it's important for uh, folks who are starting off in their farming journey to consider for various reasons is to resist the urge to overproduce. Um, start smaller, develop your market, figure out what your demand is, and then work to produce just enough to satisfy your current market um, and considering your current availability of resources. And I think it's important to do this not only to minimize waste, but to not burn yourself out in the process, growing food that ultimately isn't gonna be consumed. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of post-harvest handling and storage on our small farm. Um, Wolfgang, of course, alluded to this too, that the post-handling and um, post-harvest handling and storage can play a big role in minimizing food waste on a small farm. And this, again, comes back to just having the appropriate infrastructure and equipment to properly cool your crops and hold them in storage until they're needed. So um, what we have found is having cold storage can greatly extend um, the span of time that we have to sell our product. And this is an important consideration for us. Um, we have sort of three fairly small um, but adequate uh, coolers walk-in coolers that um, one is inside of our our main washing and packing area and it's sort of our main cooler that we use throughout the year to manage the flow of of product on a weekly basis and then we also have two um, fairly inexpensive insulated truck containers that we've equipped with cool bot um, units which essentially is like an air conditioner hack that you can use as a instead of buying like an air compressor to cool your to cool your storage spaces down. So that works well on a small farm. Um, we also use a large bubbler. Um, it's a greens bubbler that we use to wash our salad greens, but it's also really useful for removing field heat from things like kale and lettuce, radishes, broccoli. Um, and uh, our staff are, are obviously trained on what the appropriate procedures are for um, timing of harvest, we, you know, we try to time our harvest so that everything that is um, more sensitive to heat is harvested first and it comes up to the wash and pack area and gets, gets cooled quickly and into the cooler. Um, because those, those hours are so critical in terms of, of getting that field heat out and increasing the shelf life of your product. And lastly, on this slide, um, we've adopted a, a fairly simple but effective first in first out policy for anything that's going into our cooler. Uh, our staff are trained on this and they manage it really well. Um, all the bins are labeled with the date of harvest and what's in the bin so we easily know when we're in our cooler what needs to come out first to go to pack our orders. Okay next slide please. So um, I'm, I'm assuming that some people on this uh, meeting are certified organic, um, as we are. If you are certifying your products as organic, you will get well acquainted with record keeping um, and a lot of it. <laughs> uh, and the, but the good news is for um, managing waste that the certification record keeping requirements are really helpful for informing our harvests, um, which help us to reduce the waste of harvested product. Um, so for us here at Side Road, for the most part, we're harvesting our crops based on orders that have already come in. Um, so we take pre-orders wherever possible for our CSA, our wholesale counts, um, and for our online store sales, we can populate our harvest list based exact on exactly what our customers want. And then we can save whatever's not purchases, what whatever's not purchased ahead of time um, in the field for later harvests if possible, or for us, we're doing our weekly farmer's market. So usually we would plan to bring anything that hasn't been pre-ordered to the farmer's market on the weekend. Um, and I think one of our key points here that makes us successful is that we have, we have several sales outlets for our product so that if one area is, is light one week, we can often push our product that's ready in the field to another outlet. Uh, we definitely plan for regular harvest throughout the week. At minimum, we're harvesting three times per week. Um, this is important for time sensitive crops like salad. Um, crops like zucchinis and cucumbers, ideally we're harvesting those every single day um, so that we're harvesting crops at the right time and we're not ending up with overgrown unmarketable produce. Um, the big zucchinis are always one that make us laugh. I think home gardeners, when they first start growing, they'll they'll show off their big zucchini that they grew, but in reality, nobody wants to buy that at the farmer's market. So those, those are not useful for us. Um, 
And just as a final point on this, uh, all, all of these sales records, as you can see, like we we're taking pre-orders, so we have a record of what's being sold. And uh, we take careful records of, of sales at our farmer's market, which is a requirement for organic certification and also for, um, for CRA, of course. Um, and all of these sales records then in turn sort of uh, can inform our crop planning. And it's a bit of an iterative process, if you can imagine. Um, but it's important to have records of that, of what's selling. Okay, next slide. Uh, I just wanted to talk just briefly about our um, about our CSA program, how we run our CSA program. Um, I think uh, it's this is maybe getting more into like the consumer end of food waste. But um, if you've sort of been in the CSA world or you've or you've participated in any online forums about market gardening, you may have heard that CSA member retention is is something that CSA farms are always thinking about. Um, and uh, we do know that the primary reason that CSA members don't sign up year after year is that they feel guilty about the amount of food that they wasted. They feel overburdened with some of the product that they're getting, they don't know how to use it, et cetera, et cetera. So our way of working around this is, is about five years ago, I think, um, we moved from being sort of like a set harvest box that we would um, pack for our members to a customizable, um, CSA program. So what we do now is we, every week that our CSA is running, we populate what we call um, our farmer's choice box, which is usually made up of eight to 10 different vegetables. It's typically what we know is in abundance in the field that we want to move to our CSA program. Um, but then, and we do that sort of early on in the week. And then during a set amount of time, our members will go online. We use a, a, a web-based software called Farmigo. There's several other software solutions out there now. Um, but this is what we've used for the whatever nine years that we've been here running a CSA and it's worked really well for us. Um, they can go in and they can remove items that they don't want to receive in their CSA and switch them out for items that they do want. So um, a common thing would be like cilantro. It seems like you either love or hate it. Uh, we grow cilantro on our farm. We often include it in the farmer's choice box. If we have it, if we have abundance of it, and so if you don't like cilantro, you can easily take it out. Um, and uh, what we found is anywhere from sort of like a third to a half of our membership will customize their share on any given week, and the rest stick with our farmer's choice box. And this has meant uh, it's been really. We do a survey at the end of the year, and our members are just so happy with the system. Um, our CSA now sells out within two weeks. When we open it in January, we have no problem getting people signed up and we typically have a member retention rate of around 80% or more returning from year to year. So um, I think it's just a neat idea to consider if you're if you're running a CSA and it, it'll help it'll help you with your membership too. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so I have talked um, about what we do to sort of minimize food waste on our farm during the production and then post-harvest um, areas. But the reality is, is that uh, you will always end up with some excess somehow. So whether it's like you get a bumper crop or um, those sales avenues that you can't take pre-orders for like the farmer's market, sometimes we have leftovers. So what do we do with that? Um, and uh, I kind of, we have a, we, I think we have a good system here. And I just, for this presentation, um, coined the term our high hierarchy of diversion, which I think is a good way that describes how we think about how to deal with leftovers. Um, so uh, I'll just give you an overview sort of on the next few slides, but on Monday, um, when our field team comes back to work after their weekend, uh, one of the first things that they do is they go through the cooler, they assess and take stock of what's left over from the week prior and then develop from that, taking into account what's left, they develop their Monday harvest list, which is typically for CSA or and some of our wholesale accounts. So any excess um, that was left over from the week by, before, they'll sort it into our various diversion streams um, that I'll explain in the next few slides. And uh, for this first one, the first, uh, the best way and the primary way we deal with any leftovers is just simply to repack any suitable produce into our early week deliveries that was left over from the week before. A good example of this would be bunched carrots. Um, 
if these didn't sell at the market, which is somewhat unusual, but it does happen, um, or kale, uh, both of these items would have come back from the farmer's market, put, put right into our walk-in cooler and are perfectly good to send out with our early week distributions the next week. Um, okay, next slide. Our second diversion stream for excess product, um, and tomatoes are a good example of, of um, what we do on our farm, is to uh, value add using our commercial kitchen and process, um, process any excess or leftover food into products like soup. Uh, we've done um, canned tomatoes, we've done chicken stocks, things like that. Um, we do have a small commercial kitchen space, which we built into our, um, into our new washing and pack building when we built it in 2018. And it's, I'd like to say that it's been just like this amazing feature of our farm. And I think we have big dreams for it, but it has kind of taken a back seat um, during COVID while we've been really busy and had kids at home and stuff. But ideally we would be using that commercial kitchen space to value add and then resell any excess that we have. Uh, okay, you can slip to the next slide. So um, if we have excess greens, we do quite a bit of bag greens on our farm um, and they're very popular. They often sell out at the farmer's market, but there's times where we, we have a slow market day and we come home with excess greens. Um, we do resell some greens from the week prior at 50% off in our store. And that's actually been really popular. There's no stigma around that. I think people trust us enough to know that our greens last a long time and they're happy to buy a week old product. Um, but if we know that we've just got so much left over and we've got another crop that's ready in the field that needs to be harvested, we will divert to the food bank. And um, we generally are making a weekly delivery to the food bank during the growing season. It works out really well that we're already driving to um, Owen Sound to do our deliveries on Tuesdays. And it's a really simple way to, um, we just knock on their warehouse doors and then they say thank you and we drive away. So it's super smooth system and they're, they're able to serve salads to their food bank customers and they're, they're really happy with our donations. So um, we're happy to, to divert that way. And then our last stream, um, and what we do with our trimmings is we have a, a, a pasture raised pigs on our farm and they are very good at dealing with any food waste that we have that isn't fit for human consumption. And so we feel good about, about diverting there. You know, it, it keeps the food on the farm. It keeps the nutrients that we've produced on our farm. And I feel like it's a, it's a good, it's a good way to deal with any food that we produce that we can't consume ourselves. Okay, last slide. Um, so that's kind of all I was going to talk about, but I did like, as I was making this presentation, kind of um, think about some takeaway messages from, from our farm. Um, we're working on producing really only what we can sell, avoiding that urge to overproduce. Um, a little infrastructure planning ahead of time can help minimize waste by, by mitigating those chances of, uh, of losing things during times of heat stress and um, pests and things like that uh, and ensure, help to us to ensure that we're, more of our food is reaching the end consumer. Um, and then it should be obvious that minimizing waste on our farm has been somewhat of an iterative process. There's no sort of silver bullet, but these small adjustments over time and making um, revisions to our plans uh, can go a long way in terms of adding up to make a greater impact. And that's all I was going to talk about. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, I see that we've got uh, three questions so far in the Q&A. We'll look after those uh, after the next talk. Uh, next up, we're going to have Dan McKean. He's the CEO of Outcast Foods. Dan is a seasoned tech and consumer industry executive. He now leads Outcast Foods, where they are ramping up production in their Burlington facility with plans to rescue more than how many pounds, Dan? Well, he'll tell us when, when he unmutes himself of unwanted produce monthly. Outcast is a food technology company that rescues unwanted produce from farmers, processors, and retailers and upcycles them 
to create nutritional powders and ingredients. With a brand new manufacturing facility, facility in Burlington, they work with local farmers, grocers, and food manufacturers, taking their rejected, irregular, or past date surplus fruits and vegetables, keeping them in the food chain. Go ahead, Dan. Great, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I hit on mute, I don't know what happened, so that didn't, didn't work. About 10 million pounds a day, uh, I'm sorry, 10 million pounds a year is what we could do. Um, you know, our, uh, it's, it's our goal, and you can flip to the next slide, it's, it's our goal is to convert food waste into products, you know, using technology, uh, technology investments, and we're supporting the upcycled food uh, movement. So if you uh, flip to the next slide, we're one of the, the world's first manufacturers of certified upcycled food. And so, you know, it's, it's a new thing. It's, um, there's an upcycled food association, which is in, in the US. And it, it, it does mean that um, what we do is we create high quality food products, but we include products um, that would have been otherwise destined for landfill, incinerators, or animal feed. That's kind of the definition of, of, uh, of upcycled food. And so we've, we've built um, uh, purpose-built uh, factories in order to be able to do that. And so, uh, so we are one way to, to do that loss. If you can go to the next slide, and I'll I'll go fast through some of the things that have already been covered by other speakers. You know, I think Wolfgang talked about quite a bit of the same kinds of things. You know, there is food lost and waste in North America through the food chain and through various different parts of it. Um, certainly, farm and processors are the big um, ones that we see that have uh, considerable um, food waste. Uh, you know, within the in the chains, but it it does happen throughout. Um, so we'll. Uh, and I think the numbers vary depending on which studies you look at, but there is certainly significant uh, food waste. And if you go to the next uh, slide, you know, it's, uh, you know, food waste is, is quite harmful for the environment. Like it produces methane, it's 20 to 50 times more harmful to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And it's estimated to be um, responsible for 7% of greenhouse gases per year. Um, you know, there's, there's challenges in food waste and that we don't feed all the people in the world. And so that we can, and the number of people world is increasing. So, uh, you know, to be able to reduce food waste and to create uh, um, uh, consumable food from food waste, uh, it, when we talk about aff affordable, you know, nutrient dense food products with long shelf lives uh, will help feed the world. I think the last two speakers were both, were both producers and, you know, but when we process and turn um, food into, into powders, it has like a two year shelf life. So it makes a significant difference. I know they were talking about days, so we're into, into years about um, the, the, um, the powders that we create. And uh, there's a lot of economics in it. There's a lot of uh, food, you know, a trillion dollars of food annually um, 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 and an impact of over $3 trillion with soil erosion, farming resources, increased greenhouse gases, and reduced profits for stakeholders. So, you know, it's, you know, throughout the whole thing. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a common theme, but every, everybody wants to be more efficient and, and have less waste. You know, it's better for the planet and better for everyone. And if you flip to the next slide, I'll kind of show you what we do. So we have uh, this surplus produce, uh, either food processor, you know, byproducts, cutoffs, um, juice, pomace, and wines and juice trees, and we take it to our factories and we create high purity powdered products. And so we do that. And out of the output, we sell some of that directly as ingredients. So um, food manufacturers will take those as ingredients and, and turn them into, put them into their products. Um, we create proteins and greens. So Outcast Foods has our own uh, consumer packaged goods products and also some nutritional supplements is what can come out of it. So we have the two sides. We have the, you know, the input side where we're buying upcycled um, product and, and produce. And then uh, the other side where we create uh, consumer packaged goods and also where we have ingredients sold directly to uh, manufacturers. So if you go to the um, next slide, there's, you know, there's, there's good demand for upcycled food and we're going to try to make upcycled food a more of a, as a, um, a household uh, word that people use, but 
60% of people want to buy, buy more upcycled food products and 95% of people want to do their part to reduce food waste, which just it speaks to the macro demand of the public wanting to uh, make things better and to try to uh, reduce uh, food waste. So that's that's uh, the space that, that we're, uh, we're playing in. And if we go to the next slide, just more um, ammunition to that, the, the Food Network magazine and Whole Foods listed upcycled food is one of the top trends for 2021. And a report by Future Market reveals upcycled food market is worth 46.7 billion set expected a CAGR of 5% over the next 10 years. So, you know, a, a significant um, um, industry, you know, a significant amount of, of, of business and that it, it's going to grow and, and get bigger over, over time. <clears throat> and if you go to the next slide, I think it's, it was interesting to some of the producers, you know, we're concentrating on our big six crops. Um, so it's, uh, um, broccoli and uh, tomato and kale and beets and carrots and, and cauliflower are the, are the crops that we think uh, right now have the, the best um, opportunities for us, both on the ingredient side and the production side. We may do some other um, um, crops as well. Um, it, it depends. I, I talk about it as, you know, we have our big six and these are the ones that we would have, you know, in stock. So we would supply them and we're making we're currently um, uh, making uh, uh, arrangements and, and organizations with, with growers to provide us with upcycled um, produce. And so particularly, um, it, it needs to be, um, there's coordination involved. So there's coordination involved between us and, and the producers. Um, we've talked to some producers, you know, particularly on the, on the tomato side, where producers go through and, and they had, uh, like five different grades, and they're looking at creating a new grade, and a new grade would be for us. So they would have, uh, you know, a grade that goes uh, directly to um, grocery stores, which is our top grade. They might have another grade that goes to farmer markets. They might have another grade that they do something else with, and then they had a grade that was compost. And so what we're looking at is to try to create a grade for upcycled and compost. So when when people are going through and, and selecting those tomatoes there would be instead of putting them all in compost they would take ones that we could use for upcycled ingredients and put that in a bin for us and then put one another one in compost because there is some product that has gone too far that we can't we can't do anything with but there is other product that they would um, be sending to compost or incinerators or to uh, livestock feed that we can bring back and and process and and use that for um, that goes back into a a people chain um, with uh, with our powders. So we're we're very interested. We mostly do um, conventional uh, today, and we're interested in doing um, organic. Um, we have to um, establish some partnerships. Um, for us, we have you know big factories that you know do um, you know ten million pounds um, a year, something like you know thirty thousand pounds um, a day. So we have to have scheduling and, and security of supply. To be able to do that, but we're we're working through those details. That's you know that's part of the job is to work out, you know, who we're going to get supply from and, and who can supply us on a regular basis and how we can decide when we're going to process. You know, it is important to process it quickly. You know, you know, um, just in time kind of inventory. We wouldn't store a lot of produce. We would try to have everything delivered. You know, it's delivered either the day of or the morning of, and we process it. Um, you know that day or the next day so we're, we're trying to be very just in time to keep um, good quality some products the, the root vegetables obviously have a longer um, life before they get to us so it, it's less critical on that but certain things like um, tomatoes have have less time uh, to do that so if you go to the uh, next slide you can see we uh, just kind of showing where we we want to be located and um, close to uh, heavy agricultural regions, which allows, because um, uh, our, our biggest suppliers are our farms and, and manufacturers. Um, so uh, we're, in, we're in Halifax, which is close to the Annapolis Valley uh, in Nova Scotia, which has it, uh, in the uh, Shubenacadie Valley, which has the, uh, the most uh, produce. And then in, uh, we're in Burlington in, in Ontario, which is close to a large, uh, and our, our garden plant can do 
800,000 pounds per year. And I said before, Burlington at 10 million pounds per year. That's the, that's the 10 million pounds in, it'd be a million pounds out after we, uh, after we process it. And if you flip to the next slide, you know, we think that there's, there's values throughout the chain, you know, from a customer perspective, it's sustainable products. It's very appealing to the customer. Um, we, uh, we can provide food pressers with a reliable supply of, of uh, whole plant powders, um, which allows them to, to do their manufacturing. Um, from a farm, it can be a new revenue stream for surplus, surplus produce. Um, you know, it's obviously, and you hear today, and certainly in organic, you know, people are, are, have corp social responsibility and public relations is important you know, for everyone and sustainability initiatives. So we're, we can be a big part of that from the environment and societal, you know, it's, it, is, it is great for the environment because we are taking that produce, which otherwise would um, not be utilized for human consumption and putting it back into human consumption. And it um, really supports um, the uh, uh, reduced greenhouse gases because you obviously, if you don't use it, you have to grow more in order to, to fill up that. So you're an extra. And, and we're by, by reintroducing otherwise lost products back into the market with longer shelf life and high nutrient density, it, it um, grows, grows the economy. So it, it's all, uh, we think it's all very positive. And if you go to the next slide, you know, our, um, we do have deep roots in science. Our co-founder, Dr. Darren Burke is an award-winning former executive university research with an international reputation and publication record. We have a strong team and network of food scientists, engineers, and product development specialists in food safety. Um, we are, you know, beginning our journey. You know, it's not, we're not a, um, a large company by any stretch of the imagination today, but we, we, we plan and hope to be, and, and we really uh, hope to make, you know, um, upcycled food uh, uh, a household name and a, and a product that, that um, and products that people will um, buy and, and will, um, will seek out you know, most, most specifically, which is, has a lot of similarities to organic that you want to establish the brand and establish that people will seek it out. You know, we have a, a, a purpose-built upcycled, you know, plant-based ingredient and facility, and we're, we're establishing relationships um, all the time um, with, with, with people who can, you know, come along that, that journey with us. So that's really, uh, We'd be happy to have people join our mission. Um, you can visit our website for more information or contact us. Um, but uh, that's what we're doing. We're excited. We're, we're, we think that there's, a, there's big opportunities and, and it's really is, uh, really, um, it's, it's good for everyone, uh, good for the environment and, and it's, it's, good for, it's, it's good for consumers. So we're, we're excited. So, so thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, we've got time then for about uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes of, uh, of questions. Uh, we've got uh, five of them here in the Q&A box. And so if anybody else has questions, you can either raise your hand or you can um, uh, pop them into the Q&A box. And the first one is a question for Wolfgang uh, and he uh, is saying thank you for the great discussion. And what are the top five solutions to save the sector and build infrastructure for all the supply chain? So that was for Wolfgang. You're on mute, Wolfgang. Yep, there we go. Yes. You know, the world doesn't have magic bullets. Uh, it's very hard to have a one answer for everything. Um, I'd have to read the question again to really get it, what it tried to ask. Maybe I should quickly uh, go in there. Sorry, I just moved it over to answer, but it says, um... Lots of challenges. What top? What are the top five solutions to save the sector as a whole and for all, and build infrastructure for the supply chain? This might be a big picture question that we can't quite answer in this session. But go for it, Wolfgang. 
this is why my first impression was sorry there's no magic bullet uh we can't the world is in development the industry is in development uh many many changes hit the industry on a regular basis and you think you have one thing figured out by then you're being confronted with new challenges anybody in the industry knows that um, we have to be open for change we have to accept the challenges and we have to deal with them um, if i look at yeah supply chain fuel is getting more expensive um, everything is getting more expensive. Now we call it inflation. It's raising prices quicker than we can uh, charge more for the food. So all of a sudden we're getting into a bind and that's a terrible problem. Uh, so we as a, yes, we have an industry. We are an organic farm. We are a supplier to the industry. So we have the farming issues, we have uh, cost issues to deal with, and uh, it, it, it's very hard in a, in a one line answer that question. So now I talked a lot and didn't tell you anything. Um, we we started, what, what did you say? I was just gonna say, we do have a bunch of questions, so. We might want to move on to the next one just because we have a short time right now. Go ahead and do that. I'll think about more yeah. about this because we you deal with it at farm level and you deal with it at as at one layer at a time um, to address all these obstacles. But that's basically a, as it is in life. You have an obstacle, you try to overcome it. And if you have 10 obstacles, you try to get over the 10 of them, maybe one at a time, but still you do the 10 and you got to go and look what's ne what's the closest solution. It may not be perfect, but it's better than nothing. Great. Thanks, Wolfgang. Norm, we and do have got about another five here and eight minutes to go. Um, Norm. Amy, uh, your customized box sounds great. How many CSA members do you have? Customizing it sounds like it could be tricky with large numbers. <clears throat> Jamie, did you want to add? Were you asking something? Well, just after you answer this question, we have someone with their hand up, so it'd be great to let them, but go ahead with this question. Okay, um, I'll answer that quickly. We've got uh, 125 members and it works well because of the scale of our farm and the the number of members is such that we, it's not um, a large portion of our field. So um, what our CSA members take, um, they kind of get the pick of the field and then we can divert to other marketing streams. Yeah. Great. Uh, Thank Sherry. you, Amy. You want to go to a uh, hand up? Yeah, Sherry Harris, um, if you'd like to answer your question live, I've seen you've had your hand up most of the sessions, so you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Sorry, it's an accident. No problem. Oh, no question? No problem. Okay, uh, next from Nadia, um, again for Amy, how important are leftover veggies that get composted at the farm for soil health? I think that maybe that question went up there before you talked about your, uh, your pigs at the end. Um, possibly, yeah. We, just for us, we don't produce our own compost here. Um, just the volume that we use and need is not a focus of our farm. Um, I think that they can be very important for other farms and it's just sort of whatever system you've worked out, but we, we purchase in compost and then focus on growing cover crops and green manures and rotating our, our fields. And what about freezing produce for winter sales? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, it, for us, there's some infrastructure considerations like the freezer space and um, the processing equipment that would be required. But I think in general, um, in many places, certainly in Ontario and, and probably um, across Canada, there is very much a lack of processing infrastructure for vegetables. And that's something that we should think about um, sort of as, as a whole when we look at food security and um, the ability to store food through the winter, it's important. 
Okay, and I'll skip down here now to just so we make sure we get Dan in too. Dan, uh, what uh, products do you make specifically from Susan? We have a, a Super Greens product, which is a, a, a supplement of, of greens. And we have uh, five uh, protein powders that we, um, we sell in, in the, they're mostly in the nutritional sections of, of uh, stores. And we're working on single ingredient products, which will be our top six, which will be you know, beet, broccoli, carrot, cauliflower, kale, and tomato, um, you know, probably one pound, um, essentially bags of that uh, powdered product that people can use in, in, in cooking, baking, whatever, whatever they're doing with it. Okay, and from Debbie, she's got the same question I do in, in terms of uh, our, um, our number two uh, organic tomatoes and our compost organic tomatoes is how much do you pay, uh, uh, if you can maybe say that as a range of percentage of number one price, uh, can you tell us that? Um, it, it varies, so it just depends on the arrangement that we've made with, with individuals, and, and we're, we're kind of exploring and developing um, that market. So right now, we don't really know how many pounds of, of tomatoes that, that we need and, and how it will work. Um, there's, I can say there's a range of, of products. Some, some products that we produce, we don't pay anything for. So people are provided at no cost because um, otherwise they're sending it to, to landfills and they have a cost to send it to the landfills. So sending it to us is less money than sending it to the landfills because I have to pay to send it to the landfills. There are other products that we uh, we do pay for and we've made some arrangements where we have some arrangements and we're looking at some arrangements where people, it's almost like consignment. So they uh, provide us with the, uh, the processes, we process them. And then we're looking at how we're going to if, if we're able to sell them, then we would we would have some kind of a sharing agreement. And if we're not able to sell them, then we wouldn't pay for them. So it's if we're we're kind of exploring, you know, all all three of those uh, areas right now. And as I say, we're just we're just we're just starting out. So we're just learning a lot about these these markets. Okay, and three minutes left um, from uh, uh, Mike. Um, I'm not sure who this one's for, is how can we change the public perception that food is plentiful and cheap and can be wasted? Through education. Maybe the U.S. border needs to be closed for more than three days and then shelves are empty in the supermarkets. And then that'll drive a much better message than if you just tell people. Well, it's, it, that's a two-edged question, is, isn't it? You know, are, are, we, are we worse off here in Canada because we have this perception that food is cheap and can be wasted? Or would we rather be somewhere where where you know um, getting food was an issue and uh, malnutrition is an issue and uh, and food was taking up you know fifty percent of our uh, of our um, of our income and so it's a, a two edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, I, I do think that 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 waste is it's impossible to eliminate waste, but you want to try to utilize the waste in some other way. So so that you know um, people who try to change consumers, it's it's a very it's a it's it's a very difficult thing to change the public. The public has their own minds and and they do things. But I think the question is as as industries, how, how do we manage that and how, how do we make sure that as things um, as there is waste, how do how do we reduce it or do things with it that that gets it back into a stream that that uh, captures you know some of its value as opposed to all of its value, right? And so it's. Uh, I think it's it's multi pronged, as Wolfgang says. There's no silver bullet. So I've still got three questions le left here from Fresh Girl, Patricia, and Denise. And sorry, I'm gonna um, save those uh, for the end just to make sure that we get through everything. But uh, um, we'll now go to our last uh, presenter, um, the one that was named after my son, or or maybe my son was named after him, um, Alan Kirkpatrick. And he's the executive director of the uh, Canadian Corrugated and Container Board Association. 
<clears throat> and Alan, you weren't here, but uh, 30 years ago, my youngest son is Kirk Patrick Hansen. And so um, that was an interesting coincidence. Um, Alan is a leader in the corrugated packaging industry. He is presenting on sustainability in the packaging industry with a focus on corrugated and container board packaging, the importance of packaging to reduce food waste, and the changing regulations in Ontario that shift responsibility to producers. Go ahead, Alan. Hi, I'm a cardboard box, born right here in Canada, like my mother and father before me and their parents before them, produced at one of 50 production facilities across this great land and recycled more times than I can remember. And when you've been a box as long as I have, let me tell you, you learn a few things. That Canadians love boxes so much, we break them down and recycle 98% of them back into more boxes. More Canadians recycle cardboard boxes than play hockey, eat poutine, and drink double doubles combined. We love boxes so much, even when we make packages out of plastic, we ship those packages in a cardboard box. Hey, look, a big recyclable box full of stuff that's going to a landfill. We love boxes so much that even when something comes in its own natural packaging, we wrap them up in a box just to keep it nice. <laughs> What's more Canadian than that? We make 20 million boxes a day in Canada, employing over 12,000 people. We're a leader in the global corrugate industry and the backbone of the Canadian economy. Quietly, out of the spotlight, business to business, or working from home. You may not think that means much, but for boxes like me, it means a lot. Learn more about Canada's corrugate and container board industry at cccabox.org. You can advance one, Jamie. Yes, I'm just trying to do that here. Look, you went too. <laughs> well, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Norm. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and to join with the food uh, topic uh, of uh, your choice today in terms of food waste. Uh, I grew up as a youth uh, milking cows and baling hay, so I can relate to a lot of the background topics you're talking about. I spent my work career in the corrugated packaging industry, and I'm now your humble director of our Canadian Association. So I'm pleased to uh, essentially give you a background of really what we do. It's a lot of pictures. You may know some of it, but in a short time, video probably did a better job than I will be doing. Uh, I'll bring you up to date on where we're at, how we operate, and at the end, we'll share some uh, key things that would help in the food waste decisions for you. So on the next slide, you'll see what we're all about really is getting fiber. And we get a lot of it and we pay a lot of money for it, whether it's from the blue boxes, whether it's from the uh, commercial retail sector that have compactors and pile their material outside, or like the next slide, you'll see industrial waste that happens to be baled and ready to come back into our mills. Uh, one way or another, uh, it comes back to us in bailed format through the cycles and the channels that are around all of us. And these bales and these mills, as you'll see in the next slide, come into where we have 13 mills that are essentially responsible for supplying central Canada. Uh, in Ontario, you have five mills, uh, Atlantic and Cascade in Quebec. You have a group of mills from Kruger, West Rock and Cascade. And we have three mills in New York State, two by Cascade and one by Restaurant. All of these mills are feeding into the plants that are going to supply the corrugated packaging that you would order from one of our members. The key thing is, almost all of these mills are run in recycled material. I could have said 100%, but I didn't want to create an argument basis. Sometimes we do put pulp in. Uh, Latouk and Westrock is the only essentially virgin mill left in our whole network. And this has occurred over the last 20 odd years. So the feed chain into our uh, corrugated box plants is from these mills and it's essentially all recycled material. We do bring in other virgin types of material from the lower US if we need them. And these mills output 
paper that looks like the picture Jamie just had. There's nothing exciting about that. It doesn't even look like a box yet, does it? <laughs> but that's where everything is going to be made. We keep a random or sorry, we keep a broad selection of widths on hand so that we can minimize the waste. And we keep a broad selection of basis weights on hand to do the different strength contributions that go into the final package. Now these rolls, as you'll see, are going to one of the 15. Sorry. Sorry, my thing's just being sticky. Yeah. There you go one of these 15 corrugators located in Ontario. Um, Atlantic, I've gone in alphabetical order, but Atlantic has uh, four corrugators, Cascade, four, Kruger, Moore, West Rock. And then we have two that dedicate themselves to only feed sheets to the more independent style of uh, supply chain called the uh, sheet plants. Um, these Corrugated box plants are pulling from those mills and finishing the goods that are going to be made for you a, on a regular basis. And inside these plants, Jamie, rolls that came from the mills have to get inserted onto a corrugator. It takes three sidings, two faces and a, and a medium to, to make a finished sheet of board. And these rolls are inserted into a corrugator as you'll see in the next one as well, lift it up into stands approximately 100 inches wide and about as long as a football field. This is high speed, high pace. Uh, everything works better running at uh, around 1,000 feet a minute than it ever does going, going slow. Within these machines, as you'll see on the next slide, we have an ob a number of choices of the flutes that we would make to make your finished boxes. Now that's a broad range, but every corrugator probably is only going to specialize in two of those flutes. So the workhorse flute would be C flute or B flute, but there's also choices that get into the fine flutes for, uh, for consumer type packaging. And the companies that have multiple corrugators would align themselves to make different products in different plants on the corrugators themselves. Now the corrugators run, as you see from a control point of view with one person in this room, Jamie, one person here and about six people stationed out along the equipment. Um, very high tech, uh, equipment is typically from Europe. Uh, there may be uh, American subsidiaries located. Not very much equipment is actually built here in, uh, in Canada. It's serviced in Canada. Uh, but it's European technology almost uh, all the way. So this equipment at this pace on the next sheet, the output becomes an individual sheet cut to the exact size, scored if necessary to the exact precise locations to go to one of our machines to make your box. Very, very custom. Everything is set up by the order that comes in from you. We make two basic types of things within our whole industry to be quite simple about it. One of those is die cuts. A lot of you will be designing your own die cuts. And within the realm of a die cut, it all starts, as you can see, on a table from a CAD drawing. Every design is made on a table like this for a design specifically for you. You're going to get this prototype to sign off on. And this prototype as you'll see, is going to be used after you've signed off on it to build a steel rule die. It's going to be built looking a lot like this. When you look at a die, you can't hardly tell what it's going to produce unless you really look closely at all the, the steel rule. And it's built to go on a cylinder within our die cutter. In addition to the actual steel rule die, we need to put graphics on for you. These graphic layouts are made specific to every box as well. You sign off on this. These plates are made and those two tools combine to go onto the rotary die cutter and produce such as, now we're finished out of the machine through the die cutter, through the print plates and stacked and ready to be assembled off of the machine. Um, fairly high paced as well. The second category of products that we make fall into the regular slotted box family. 
We make them in almost any size, whether you're packing refrigerators or plastic pellets, or whether you're making a fine little package for cosmetics. We have different size machines. They're all essentially doing the same thing. And that is from the next slide, you'll see those sheets that came off the corrugator specific to the order are fed through a flexo folder gluer like this from the back, very automated, two person operation. And on the same machine using the same graphic uh, concepts, we will insert the plates required to put your print on. And this machine running at 35 to 40,000 boxes an hour will produce the output that looks like that. All fast, all simple, all tooling, uh, precise to the uh, package it's made. And at the rate that they're being put out of this machine, they're gonna be piled and ready for uh, strapping and shipment out to you. Um, high speed, uh, a typical plant in, in today's language is going to ship somewhere around 80 truckloads a day. Um, smaller plants would be less, but 80 to, to slightly more would be, uh, would be very common in the, the way our plants are operating today. Now I wanna to touch on some key things that I would offer to you from our industry about food waste. I'm going to talk about only four. The first one is palletizing. When you're planning and designing your packaging, don't have overhang and use column stacking absolutely as much as you can. You're going to lose, I'll pick a number and say 20 or 25% of your strength if you don't column stack. So pretty big investment in packaging not to make the best use out of it. I want to remind you that automation is your friend. When you put in automated equipment to assemble our packages, you can design places and, and ways to fold the sections and glue them into place, creating way more strength than you ever do from corrugated board on its own, plus the labor saving that you too would have. The third one I can say, because I'm semi-retired from the industry, but don't negotiate on stacking strength. Your spec, that you're negotiating to buy from a supplier is very specific to you. If you encourage someone <laughs> to give you 10% off and all they do is change the materials to make something lighter and weaker, you're going to regret it and your food waste issue <laughs> will, will be affected. Um, I just wish our industry actually had a bit more uh, backbone in, in, in not doing this. <laughs> Um, there are other, other choices to get to uh, some of the solutions for negotiating, but please just remember that don't, don't give up on the strength that you need for your packaging. And on a last point, it's marketing punch. You want your products to sell, so let's put it into something that goes onto the shelf and attracts consumers and will be bought and, and taken home and not get into the waste column. And some investment on marketing punch is, I think, a good thing, uh, a good thing to do. So on a photo on the next shot, I simply want to remind you about the column stacking. Now, these are examples that are designed by the supplier to work effectively as a column stack. But if you were filling a pallet with boxes, you could column stack only the bottom third or half of the, of the layers, and then you could start to interlock. That is also an extremely wise thing to do to maintain the strength as you build up your, your pallet load of product before you, you ship it. Just want to continue to emphasize how important that is. And where are we going? Well, less labor in our plants. We can't get enough, as you can imagine, and I think it's the same situation for yourselves. We just have to continue to have, uh, have machinery installations that are going to put out more volume um, with less labor. I'm not saying we need less plants. To be honest, we might need more plants because this running 24 hours a day isn't easy. We should maybe run uh, on two shifts a day with more plants and better equipment. I think we might be a better industry if we went down that road. Technology is everywhere. Manufacturing 4.0 is here. Um, we're only as good as the presentations that are made to us from those supply chains in Europe or Japan, but they really do make a huge difference. When I mentioned that our equipment was making 35 and 40,000 boxes an hour, it's only about 20 years ago, we wouldn't even get half of that. Um, 
So people in Japan at MHI, I give them credit. They took something in our industry that's very, very basic, and they made it a specialty simply because it runs so fast. I think there's a lot of smart packaging uh, opportunities coming in our world, and that also is related to technology. And traceability is a direction that I think we need to do better on. And just as a reminder, every order you get from one of our supply chains will have a corner marker on it with a unique order number. So that will date the product. You could then use that chain of, of events back to identify exactly where those uh, materials came from if you record that number. But we can do better than that with technology. We're not gonna do it by hand, but with technology, we can do better on traceability uh, uh, as well. So those are the highlights of our industry. Uh, some of you know it better than others, and I thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing some of our, our background and our story. So thank you, Norm. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, the two uh, at the bottom here from uh, Martin and Crystal. Um, not, I'll give you a crack at it, Alan, and then, uh, then maybe I'll take a, a small crack at it. Um, if used cardboard is used as a weed control mulch on organic farms, are there glues and inks that may prevent organic certification and what types of glues are used? Mm. My gut reaction would be no. Um, and I'm really not in a position to understand the precision of, of, uh, of types of glues, but uh, the opportunity to fulfill that information would not be difficult. We don't have a large supply chain of glues. But when we recycle, it's just add water and mix. I mean, there's, there's really no ingredients of, of concerns that come to my mind. Now we could do more, uh, more research on that to be sure. But I guess I would also remind you that we pay anywhere from 50 to $80 a ton to get the fiber back. So putting it onto fields as fertilizer is kind of an economic way to, to trade things off. Um, we'll, we'll buy it back and use it for more paper products. Yeah, it's more of a standards question, I would say those two. And so you wanna to talk to your certifier about those. That's always the answer is, uh, is talk to your certifier. Um, you know, read the section on mulches and, and talk to your certifier and maybe talk to your specific cardboard supplier yeah. in, terms of, um, um, in terms of glues. I know that we've run into that in the greenhouse where we had like a paper wrap uh, used uh, around soil to make a plug for for seeding uh, for seeding tomatoes, and they were definitely concerned about the composition of the paper and the composition of the glue. And so, it's mm. it's something that you're going to want to talk to. It's a whole nother area when we're talking about recycled cardboard and what came before. But generally, um, it says that cardboard is allowed. And so what these other things would be allowed, um, talk to your certifier um, is, is always the, uh, the, the, the answer there. And, and Wolfgang is nodding his head. Yep, absolutely. Um, um, and then we got a question here from uh, uh, Patricia. And I think this was for Amy. Um, another aspect of waste is the curse of the bumper crop. Like when the weather makes all your early and late varieties and perennials ripen at the same time, would the farmers agree that creative and fluid approaches are also key to dealing with food waste? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that in a lot of cases, those bumper crops are unavoidable. And, but for, for a small farm having like various marketing avenues and then possibly the potential to value add um, with a kitchen or um, partnerships with people who can use those products um, is key. So relationships and, and infrastructure. Um, interesting from the, uh, from our tomato greenhouse point of view is, you know, we need to be within, depending on the contract, 10 or 20% of what we forecast in shipping to our marketer four weeks ahead of time. And so that 
is something that you need to really spend a lot of, of uh, mental capacity on doing because we get really dinged if we get outside of those uh, bounds. And four weeks, boy, there's a lot of weather that's happening in four weeks, even inside a greenhouse that can make things come, come earlier or later. And we're actually looking at software to help us do that, that would take a look at history, previous years, um, um, how the crop is growing, and even weather forecasts to try and help make a data-based um, uh, decision there that certainly is better than if we wing it and probably is better even if we put a lot of mental capacity uh, into it, just from a personal point of view. Wolfgang, what have you got to say on, uh, on, uh, on that one? Just like you said, I didn't know that greenhouses, you have that much variation and still can double put two crops together and then you have a gap. So I thought this is only in the outside, uh, like in the fields. To a, oh yeah, our yield can go, let's say, in a, if it's cool and kind of in a dip time, um, say at 1.5 and we might peak at three. And we kind of know when those are, but boy, the, the, the weather can really push that around. And, uh, and, and if we get out of bounds, it can cost us lots in terms of penalties. Yes, and if you have tomatoes, um, it's tricky with carrots and beets, it's not so bad, but we, hit, we get hit with the same thing. And we always find that having good storage and relationships is usually what helps us. Relationships yeah, the in the marketplace. Because the reason for the four weeks is because our marketer at four weeks has time to talk to the supermarkets and they can put a special on. But if it's any closer than that, it's beyond, it's, it's, it's within their uh, um, time where they can't change their flyers and ads and specials and things like that. That's the same with us, it's tight. And when you are tight, you know, and then you make a promise, hey, we're gonna have a good lettuce crop and then you have a hail and then you have no lettuce crop. And then you have those people making, put, having put your lettuce on flyer, uh, scream at you because you don't have lettuce to ship. Yeah, they don't scream at us, they just ding us, you know? And that's exactly for the same reason. It's a, yeah, it's a tough world. Hmm. Okay, and Denise, uh, that this is maybe something for OCO. Um, we're certainly mm -hmm. talking about education and, uh, and this was information, that, this was in response to the question that, um, that um, we wanted to educate people that food isn't just something that's cheap and should be thrown away. And she sees, it says, is it possible to get this information into the school curriculum so kids can better understand food nutrition and food production of various sorts? And uh, yep, yeah, that's absolutely something we should be doing. Anybody want to comment on that? very important that uh, schools teach these things and maybe it hasn't been done enough in the past and the future should really look like it. for the future they should really look into teaching all these kids look at the recycle program the blue box program uh, really took off once they taught the kids at school so that when the kids come home from school, they said, mom, dad, guess what we learned today? And all of a sudden the parents listen. And then we've got two questions from Jason uh, that are related uh, for Alan. Um, are there new water resistant packaging materials that are recyclable? And are there alternatives to wax coated boxes at a compar compa comparable cost? Um, there's a good range of choices for the alternatives to wax. Um, most of them uh, would certainly be in the range of, uh, of affordability because the process is that the paper is typically coated first. So we're just converting it in line as we, as we proceed. I have to admit though, that in the most rugged situations, uh, it's still very difficult to, to uh, eliminate the, the wax choice. 
So in that sector, I think I would probably pick uh, broccoli as one. Um, very difficult to live up to the way that that crop is is handled with anything uh, short of uh, of the wax product. There was a quick question in there about are wax products recyclable? Uh, the answer is no, they're compostable, but they are not recyclable. So we certainly want to use as many of the alternatives as possible. We uh, certainly have them in a cost uh, comparable uh, uh, range, but I hesitate to say that they're 100% effective because of the rugged issue that goes with it. And Jamie's got a couple of answers to a couple of those. Do you think we'll ever be able to recycle wax boxes? Mm. Not in a paper mill. Um, you'd have to have a process, Wolfgang, that would extract the, uh, the paraffins. So that would be a secondary step to make the fibers uh, available, but wow. It would have to be one of those situations that you had a product cycle that would be off and make something completely different. I don't see it coming back into the paper mills. The, the mills are running so fast, so strong, they can't cope. That that just okay. everything, everything has to be a good system of, of effectiveness and, and wax doesn't do it. My cousin in Germany runs a plant that burns a lot of materials into and they make steam and make electricity and sell it and you could imagine all of north america could burn all of its wax boxes we heat the outdoor wood furnace with it but you could burn and turn all those wax boxes into and make electricity instead of dumping them into landfill yeah energy from waste topic uh, is, is essentially what you're referring to and it's very bona fide um our society is not quite there yet there are some companies uh uh, Algonquin Power uh, in Toronto, I believe, is one that is down that path of uh, energy from waste, uh, but it's very tightly uh, managed from the government levels. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got one minute left here, and so um, uh, let's see here. I'll go with Carolyn. Uh, um, I'm curious if anyone knows anything about laser engraving branding you see in Europe where the brand is right on the vegetable. We've seen it on vegetable trade shows where they have a little laser and they put the, lo the company logo into the orange skin. I don't know anything about it other than that it's an, like an engraving thing. I don't think it affects the, the food or the orange. You don't eat the peel of the orange. Um, you know, we are being confronted with the by the by the government to lot number everything. So now we have to lot number every parsley bunch, and every carrot bag, and every spinach bunch or green onions, and that at the end of the year costs us fifty thousand dollars in wages extra, and we haven't sold a single box extra. Um, so we're hit with an, a big expense, and for which we get nothing in return. And if you run it through a laser machine that would do this automated pay, you know, that would get products lot coded without uh, involving wages. Yeah, I've even seen it done on cucumbers where it's just a laser. And so it's just heating the skin, basically. It's just burning it. And uh, if you do it lightly on the skin of a cucumber, it, it's still edible. So. Uh, I've seen that advertised in some of our trade magazines. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the extent of what I know about it. And we are to a minute left here. And so I will pass it back to Jamie for the closing. Thank you, everybody. That was really great. Thank you so much, Norm and Dan and Alan and Amy and Wolfgang for joining us and bringing all your different perspectives uh, to the session. Also a big thank you to the interpreters uh, Brian and Adrian, as well as our sponsors. A special thank you to Fennings Organic Farm who um, sponsored this session. We hope that you can provide us with session feedback. I've shared a link in the survey or a link to the survey in the chat, and this just helps us improve the programming and your experience at Guelph Organic Conference. 
Our next section is happening this afternoon. It's the Eco Scholar Spotlight, uh, where the two Eco Scholar winners will be sharing their research on bio biodiversity in regeneratively grazed pastures, as well as increasing organic field crop phosphorus uptake. So that's happening from 2.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And we just hope you also go to uh, the exhibit hall on the conference platform, visit the virtual trade show booths, as well as use the networking functions to discuss what you've just learned and connect with other attendees. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you at some of the other sessions later this week. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Norm. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. I'll just keep the session open for a couple minutes in case anyone wanted to grab some of the links uh, that were shared in the chat. 